and info can be found at lakeland.org. Where do we find meaning in our lives? Some have tried accomplishments, gaining power, finding people they love, knowledge, money, art, physical ability. But with tragedy always around the corner and the inevitable march we are all on to the end, as Christians we learn, apart from God, we gain nothing from all our toil. The author Solomon wants to help us think about the lives we are living while we're still living them and where they are taking us. What's the point? Is there any meaning to life? If so, where do I find it? Through the book of Ecclesiastes, we will embark on the search for meaning in our lives with Jesus. Indeed, we will. Good morning, Lakeland family. It is good to see you. Thank you. That's good. At home, you as well. If you're a guest and we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Dan. I serve on staff here. I've been here a long time. Our whole church family is so honored that you're here. And wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you will find this to be a safe place to discover who God is, who's reaching out to you right now. Uh, Say to the person next to you, good morning. Go ahead and do that. And then say thanks again for sitting next to me. Go ahead and do that. Two quick, um, two quick family things before I open up our text today. The first is this. Um, we offer, you hear this thing called the Lakeland Institute. If you don't know what that is, they're classes, but they're not random classes. Um, we've discerned different levels of kind of beginner and intermediate and growing sort of how do I study the Bible? What does the Bible say? How do I live this Christian life in this incredibly complex place. And so there, it's sort of a comprehensive group of classes that we share. And so I want you to know that. Last time we took the survey, last fall, like, like 85% of you said, if we offered a class that spoke to something that was meaningful to you, you would participate. Um, and so we, and then we asked, what should we do? What should we offer? And you gave us all kinds of things. Those are the classes we're offering. They're shorter term than small groups. If you're not plugged into a small group, you can join one of these for six weeks. At the end of six weeks, you will be in a better place. So we have two that are starting soon. Um, tomorrow evening, many of you said, I want to know how to, I want to study a book of the Bible. Well, Brad Anderson has spent months preparing an overview of the Old Testament. So if you don't know how the whole Old Testament fits together, Monday, tomorrow evening, Brad Anderson starts that. It will be wonderful. And the next Sunday, Parker Setacase starts a study, a study on defending Christianity, on apologetics. Um, many, most of you said, if you could help me in my witness with other people, I would be a part of that. Well, for the next six weeks, Sunday morning at nine o'clock, you can meet with um, me as a part of this class. Parker's best, the best guy in our church to do, to, to do this. If his idea of fun would be to be in a room with a hundred thoughtful atheists who are attacking the faith. That'd be fun for our friends. So I want to encourage you to participate in that. That's next Sunday morning. It helps us if you register. So that was kind of point one. Point two. Several of you came up to me after the message last week and shared, uh, they asked the question about a quote I shared. I quoted Ravi Zacharias. Now, many of you, you may not know who he is, but for those of you who did, Ravi had a a long-term evangelistic ministry, but after he died, it turned out there there was a secret sort of part of his life that wasn't good. And so, um, sometimes when folks do that, we just sort of kind of, maybe it's appropriate, don't quote them anymore. I didn't qualify my comment, and here's why. Uh, Well, I should have qualified it. Here's what I would have said had I done it. I'm never sure when someone has had moral failure whether or not to quote them. I know God works through sinners. I trust that much of what God did in Ravi's life and through him was, was wonderful, and other things weren't. So it's a judgment call to use a quote like that. It's not a statement that I don't think that he did anything wrong. But at the same time, I know God works through fallen people. And so if if that was unsettling to you at all, I want to apologize for that. I will try not to say anything today that I have to apologize for next week. (laughs) Doesn't happen often. But I just wanted to speak to that issue because our relationship is important to me. And so I wanted to just take a moment there. So now, Father, as we open up your word, I pray you would take my little words And through them, somehow we all would hear your voice, which formed the universe, which called out to Lazarus to rise from the dead, which invites us through the gospel to be born again and to love you and walk in step with you. 
We don't want to sit on the outside and hear of your work in other people's lives. We want you to work in our midst right now. We pray worship would rise in our hearts in response to what you say to us today. So we lay our lives before you. Uh, Remove everything that hinders us following you. And may we trust you. And may we be indeed healed today and restored to walking with you. Thank you, Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you have a Bible uh, on your phone, open it up and scroll there. It's page 319 under your, uh, in the Bible under your chair. If you don't have a Bible, you can take that one. That's our gift. A week ago, Saturday morning at 4 a.m., <laughs> we learned we had a plumbing problem. Now, my mom was staying over with us, so she comes in the, our bedroom at 4 in the morning and says, the toilet down to the first floor toilet, it is overflowing. I re- <laughs> I get up, I run down. It wasn't overflowing, it was hemorrhaging, right? Water was pouring out into what had become a a pool in the bathroom and the laundry room part of our house. And so the alarm went out to everybody and my mom and Lisa and Ben and I started sopping up water as much as we could. I ran downstairs to turn off the water. I heard a sound in my shop that sounded like rain. I went in, it was raining hard in my shop in another part of the room. Right? I wish I could tell you that I broke out immediately in the hymn, it is well with my soul. <laughs> I did actually pray for my heart's response to this whole thing while I was in the middle of it. Not fun. Now eventually the water stopped flowing and a plumber later let us know that we didn't have a toilet problem, we had a sewer problem, which is why I've now called it sewer geddon. That's what happened in our home. <laughs> Gosh, it was something. And he speculated what turned out to be true, that over time our house has settled and the line coming out of our house therefore sheared off and for some time, that's actually a picture of the hole. Yeah, I I don't want to fill in the details too much here, but for some time we'd had a problem and finally that morning it just clogged. And so when it clogged, anything in the system came out of the lowest spot, which happened to be that downstairs toilet. That was what the problem was. And we knew that this was a problem because we had to hire a backhoe to come in. This is what my front yard looked like for a while to get to the problem and solve it. Now, since then, I sucked about 15 gallons of water out of one room and we have sanitized and bacterialized and we have dried. And so anyways, we've been doing the best we can to try to put our house back in order. But it is shocking how an out of sight, deep clog can devastate a house. And when you have an out of sight, deep clog, it's amazing how dramatic and expensive and overwhelming the solve of that thing is. Now, why do I tell you this as we open up the word of God? Well, because I think the same thing is true of our souls. I think at times, deep in our souls, there are, there are clogs. There are things we believe, actually believe, that are false. And because they're there, they're out of sight. And you can sort of go through the motions and go through your life. But then things happen. And when they happen, it is as if the whole system explodes. And the amount of work that goes into bringing healing is overwhelming. And sometimes, frankly, it never happens. I think this happened in Solomon's life. I mean, just one moment for me to give you an example of what I think in Solomon. So I've got a plumber on the phone. It's like six in the morning. I am quick ladling water out of this toilet into the sink. And I'm doing this for 20 minutes and my arm is getting tired. And the plumber says, where are you putting the water? And I said, in the sink. And he laughed and said, it's a closed system, Dan. All you're doing is putting water back into the toilet again, right? I think sometimes we get like something's wrong and we try to fix it and try to fix it and try to fix it and it doesn't get better. This happened to the third king of Israel, whose name was Solomon, son of David. He gets to the end of his life. This is the simplest way that I understand the framing of the book of of Ecclesiastes. He gets to the end of his life that in this world, he was arguably the single most successful human being in the world in what he accomplished. And he gets to the end of his life and he looks back expecting to find some satisfaction for what he's done. Like his soul will be full. And he'll be contented and happy. But he looks down at his soul and he discovers not only is he not happy, his, his heart is as empty as it was when it began. For all that he accomplished, for all the success in this world that he had, he wasn't in a better place. In fact, he looked back at everything that he'd done and he said, what a waste. 
it's meaningless. The word is hevel in Hebrew. And so I purchased this Hurricane 1600 device to illustrate what I mean. He looked back and, sorry, Chris, here we go again. We look back, he looked back at his life and he said, for all the substance I thought that was gonna be there, I see what I've done, but I go to grab it and there's nothing there. I get to the end of my life and it's like, I have eaten a meal and the meal has been vapor. And the one that he talks about in our text today is specifically success. He had had so much success in the world, he expected it to provide something for him. And at the end of his life, he discovered it is not there. So gratefully, he has written the book of Ecclesiastes to unpack this and other areas that he searched so that we would learn a lesson that he apparently hadn't learned yet. Okay, so that we would get this. So if you've read Ecclesiastes, it is not like any other book in the Bible. It makes very, it doesn't make a few, but it makes very few declarations about God. It makes a few, but not many. It doesn't solve many problems. Mostly it asks us questions, penetrating questions, probing, and dare I say, unsettling questions when it uncovers ways that we have built our life upon things that are false. And the one that he had built his life on apparently to some degree was thinking if he was successful, then his life would have meaning. And he comes to the end and he says, that was all vapor. The main point that we see today is this. Success, this is Solomon's point. Success in this life, it is a gift from God, but it's not him. Success is his gift. Success in the world is his gift, but it's not him. And therefore, we can't treat it like it's him. We can't look to success in the world to give us what only he can do. That's what it is that he shares. He's going to share three failures of success. And, and then he's going to share how is it, therefore, that we as God's people go through this whole thing of achievement and accomplishing things and making a difference with God in the middle of it. That's where we go, okay? The first point I'm going to make to unpack this success in this life is God's gift, but it's not him, is this. I'm going to start with an observation of the world and then come back to our text. So here it is. Your success in this life will not provide lasting meaning. It won't. Can't. Impossible. Lasting meaning. Success can't do that. Now, you get why we might think that. Let me ask this question. When you've accomplished something, when you've succeeded at building something, do you find that satisfying? Yes or no? Yes? yes. Yeah, of course we do. When we've, like, I made, <laughs> I made my kid's crib. Let's just start with that. I, I didn't buy a kit I just bought a bunch of mahogany, which I will never work with again because it's soft and splinters and it's terrible word to work with. But I bought this. I didn't have hardware for brackets for the up and down screen. I'm like, how do you make a screen? I figured out a way to do that. And so I worked really hard on this thing that no one in my family wants to use anymore. Sorry, that's a little pain I'm just sharing right here, right? But it took a long time. And so guess what I did at the end of every day when I was finished working on it, I go clean up. Guess what I would do? I would go back down in the basement and look at it. I just would. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone back to see something you made? Well, where does this come from? Why are we like this? Because we've been made in the image of God. Who made the universe out of nothing? And at the end of every single day of creation, the Bible says God looked at it and saw it is good. So if we were writing the story about Dan, we could say Dan went down in the basement and he saw what he had made and it was good, all right? That's satisfaction and it's real. It's, it can come in all kinds of forms. Did I make the team? Am I doing well at work? Am I getting advances? Did I get, I mean, any form of success does that. Okay, so where is the failure in this success? And here's what I would say. Would you agree with me? Most people believe if they're successful enough it means their life matters. Make the team, get the job, get the promotion, whatever it is, however you would define success, win the championship. That if we do that, it's not just delightful and satisfying. Something about that victory says something about me. This is certainly reinforced in the way that our culture operates. Anybody ever heard of that guy, Elon? What's his last name, Elon? Yeah, who, Elon. Who's ever heard of Elon? Well, all of us have. Why? Because our culture treats the successful like royalty. I literally mean royalty. We don't have royalty in our country. Oh, yes, we do. They're called the successful celebrities. They're on the other side of 
ropes and they walk on red carpets and they're different, they're distinct. Our culture reinforces the idea that if you're successful, you matter, you're valuable. And it finds its way into our language. We don't, when I was younger, I remember people saying things like, yeah, I, I had some success. I've had some success. But now people say, I say it, I, I am a success. You realize the switch that's taken place there? That suddenly if I'm successful enough, not only does my life have meaning, but if I keep succeeding, I am a success. This is actually my identity. So what happens to the person in the world who doesn't succeed, who gets cut from the team, who thinks being on the team is what it is that means their life matters, who doesn't only not get ahead in their job, but they lose their job? What happens to the person whose identity is founded on some kind of success that doesn't come? You know what happens when that moment comes? They disintegrate. They disintegrate. They're utterly devastated because at the core of their very sense of being, succeeding is what proved that they mattered. Or what happens to the person who actually does succeed more wildly than they could ever have imagined, and they get to the end of that success and they look back like Solomon and think, this didn't provide for me what I expected at all. Jim Carrey has been an interesting guy. I don't know him, I don't know him and I don't, I don't follow him often, but lately I've been paying attention to him because he's retired. He said some fascinating things. A few years ago, he was at the Golden Globe Awards. He was introduced. He came out in front of all of the Hollywood elites. And now, please welcome two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. So Jim comes to the microphone. He's going to announce, uh, he's, he's going to share the results of an award. He said... Yes, I am not Jim Carrey. I am two-time Globe award-winning Jim Carrey. When I go to bed at night, I'm not just any guy going to bed. I'm two-time Golden Globe award-winning Jim Carrey going to bed for much-needed shut-eye because I've worked so hard. When I dream, <laughs> I don't just dream any dream. I dream big dreams. I dream of being three-time Golden Globe award-winning award -winning Jim Carrey. And then he says this, and it's tongue-in-cheek, and yet there is a truthfulness to it. Because, he says, because then when I'm three-time Golden Globe award-winning Jim Carrey, I would be enough. It would finally be true. And I could stop this terrible search for what ultimately won't fulfill me. And again, there was a tongue-in-cheekness to this. But it was fascinating. A few years earlier, he said, I think everybody ought to get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they could know it is not the answer. And so he's retired. He may do a few things. And I, the interview I saw last night, the person said, what are you doing in your retirement? And he said, I'm going to be spectacularly boring. <laughs> Nothing. I'm a normal. I'm going to be normal. Because he's pursued this, apparently looking for it to satisfy something, and it didn't. That's certainly where Solomon was at. To us, even as Christians, in subtle ways, so pay attention if this hits a nerve, in subtle ways, I can think my worth is defined by my success. Even, I'm a pastor, you'd think I'd get this right. You would not believe how many times I've been up in the middle of the night because I thought I was failing because our church was admitting hitting some mark. And I've tasted Jesus' goodness. The possibility, I can, I can hold on to the Lord and still somehow deep down think, yeah, I have Jesus and I'm successful. And that's called a clog. That's a clog in my spirit. Solomon had it and he points it out. We, you, know why, you know why success in this world can never satisfy your soul? Ultimately, long term? Because you were made for infinitely more than just success in this world. Your soul was designed for glory. To worship God in glory, you would design. He has, I'm spilling the beans on a future sermon. He has set eternity in your heart. That's why the temporal will never ultimately satisfy you. It does for a moment. It's a gift from God. Where do I get this from this passage, right? Fail, the, the failure of success. Well, here's why. Because as I read it now, at several points, we're going to hear Solomon look back at his success and say it was meaningless. And that line makes no sense at all 
if he hadn't been looking for his success to mean he meant something. See what I'm saying? Success in this world cannot provide lasting meaning. We move on. A second point is this. Your success in this life also can't make you live any longer than a fool. <laughs> let's, let's, let's read what the Word of God says. So Ecclesiastes 12, 2 verse 12. Let's just start here. So Solomon says, So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes, what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw there was more gain in wisdom than folly. There's more gain in light than darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walk, walks in darkness. And yet, I perceive that the same event happens to them all. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For, um, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will be long forgotten how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to men who come after me and who knows whether they'll be wise or a fool. Yet he'll be master of all for which I have toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity, a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Then verse 24, there's a turn. There is nothing better for a person to do than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or have any enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner who is given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give it to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity, a striving after the wind. This is God's word. So I would say, here's where we're going to go. I'll say it again. Success is God's gift in this world, it's, but it's not him. For one thing, God can give you lasting meaning but your success can't. Success in this world cannot give you lasting meaning. Second of all, your success in this life won't give you any more life than a fool. <laughs> this, is, this is great. He looks back, right? He doesn't, he looks back at his life and he doesn't regret, Solomon, he doesn't regret that he lived wisely. Right, he doesn't think, verse 14, the wise person has eyes, I'm sorry, verse 13, then I said there is more to be gained in wisdom than folly, there's more gain in light than darkness. He doesn't look back and think, foolish people in my day just lounged around, didn't think of the future, lived for the moment. I didn't do that. They produced nothing. I produced more. He doesn't say, I wish I'd just been them. Wisdom is definitely better. But then verse 14, he says, the wise person, right? The wise person has eyes in his head. The fool person walks in darkness. Half of Americans have less than $10,000 in savings. One in four Americans approaching retirement. I'm sorry, half of Americans have no savings. One in four Americans retiring, approaching retirement have only $10,000 saved. That's not wise. Right? That's not preparing for the future. So Solomon isn't saying, I wish I was that guy. And yet he has this overwhelming realization. And yet, even though I've lived wisely my whole life, and this person hasn't lived wisely, he goes on to say, yet I perceived that the same event happens to them all. Anyone know what that event is? What is that event? He dies. The mortality rate of the human race still hovers right at about what? 100%. You're going to die. Right? I saw the insurance company that says, you need life insurance in case the unthinkable happens. And it's like, what culture calls unthinkable? What is inevitable? Right? You're going to die. It's actually 99.99999% because Jesus died and then he rose again. So he wrecked the curve. All right? 
he rose, but other than that, you're going to die. And so he thinks, I've lived wisely. Look at all I have to show for it. This man has lived foolishly. He has nothing to show for it. We're on different paths, but our paths end up in the same place. And in the big picture, what then is the value of all of the wisdom that I've shared? Why then do I, um, why then have, he asked the question, why have I been so wise? If I've been trying to secure the secure future, I get to the end of it. You know what? I have no more stability than a foolish person. Leo Tolstoy, who um, somebody said today uh, tortures high school students because he's so hard to read. (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. Leo Tolstoy was a Russian novelist. And as a novelist, he wrote this in his confessions. When he was 50 years old, a question crossed Tolstoy's mind that led him actually to the verge of suicide. It was the simplest of questions lying in the soul of every person. He said, a question without an answer to which one cannot live. And so what was the question that he asked? This is it. What will come of what I'm doing today or tomorrow? What comes of it? What will come of my whole life? Why should I live? Why wish for anything? Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitability of my death does not destroy? And it brought Tolstoy to the end of himself. He just, he just thought, I've, built, I've done all of this. And then, then at the end of the day, I'm going to end up dead just like a fool who accomplished nothing himself. This is his question. And then he goes even further than that. You remember a couple weeks ago, he talked about legacy. Everyone wants to leave a lasting legacy. How will I be remembered when, I've gone, when I'm gone? How will I be remembered? And the answer is, what's the answer? The answer is, you won't be remembered when you're gone. Right? Do you know anybody who lived here 100 years ago? Do you care? 100 years ago, 100 years from now, no one will remember any of us in this room or anything we've ever done or care about it. So if I'm trying to base my life on legacy, it's, it's a myth. Now he missed. Now he goes forward and says the same thing is also true of a fool. Not only will I be forgotten, the fool will be forgotten. We're going to be forgotten in exactly the same ways. I won't even stand out when it comes to people's memory of my death. And so he says in the end of verse 15, and I said in my heart, this also is vanity. Why have I accomplished all this? For the wise as of, um, for of, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. Seeing that in the days to come, all will have been forgotten how the wise die just like the fool. So what's the point of all, what's the point of being wise? He says, verse 17. So I hated life. Because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity is striving after one. Success in this life can't give you lasting meaning. It can't make you live longer than a fool. There's a third failure to success. Your success in this life will be enjoyed by people who didn't earn it. <laughs> this one drove Solomon berserk. Absolutely berserk. If you remember, we saw last week the city that Solomon built was the envy of the world. He built homes. He built Eden-like gardens that, that watered forests. He had a pool that watered a forest. I won't go through the whole list. He had innumerable slaves and servants and food to eat because his flocks and herds were so vast, right? He, and again, he at some point was thinking, because I have these things, this means I'm the king. This means I matter. This means I'm successful, But then another thought crosses his mind, and it shakes his perspective. Verse 18, I hated all my toil to which I did under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to men who will come after me. He had risked, he had invested, he had worked, he had been wise and skillful. He'd given his whole life to the building of this, and then he dies. Somebody else gets it. Somebody gets what I have worked for that they haven't worked for. And more than that, verse 19, who knows whether it will be wise or a fool. What happens if this great city that I've created lands up, ends up in the hands of a fool who wrecks it? Which is kind of what happened. Maybe Solomon knew his son Rehoboam. And if you know anything about Rehoboam, if you don't think about, maybe he's looking at Rehoboam just thinking, I don't know how this is going to go. Rehoboam, it takes him about a month and one horrible leadership decision, and 80% of Solomon's kingdom dissolved and went away. So 
if I think building things gives me lasting meaning, I can't even keep enjoying them. And they're going to end up in the hands of somebody else. Yet this person will be master of all for which I have tell and use my wisdom under the sun. So his conclusion, this too is vanity. What's the point of that? Verse 20 and 21, this led Solomon again to despair. Goodness, this is vanity. Verse 22, what has a man for all the toil and striving in his heart with which he toils beneath the sun, right, in the world in which you can see, spent years doing this, for all his days are full of sorrow. Every night his heart didn't rest. He remembered his sleepless nights. And now I'm going to hand this to a fool. This also is vanity. This is another failure of success. That the joy that you create in this world, you cannot keep enjoying. It goes to somebody else. Okay? So these are failures of success. And to the degree you and I, in the core of our soul, think by success I matter. We are susceptible to devastation. But then we come to verse 24 and it almost reads to me like Solomon has been, he's been wrestling with these things. He's just had a huge day where he's gotten a lot accomplished. He sits down to a meal with food that he made, right? That at least his estate had produced. And he has a thought, a thought crosses his mind and there's a turn. There's like a, there's a a switch goes on. Look at it in verse 24. Here's what he says. So I'm looking at my food and I think, you know, in this life, In the world we can see, there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And now here's the line. This also I saw was from the hand of God. He's enjoying his food. And instead of thinking, look at another fantastic meal my estate produced, perhaps he picks up a banana. And he said, who makes this? (laughs) Have you ever looked closely at a banana? I mean... (laughs) where do these things come from? Orange juice. Who thinks orange juice is a good idea? The avocado. Awesome. Beets. The devil could have kept them. I don't need them. (laughs) He looks at the food that he's enjoying, the success that he's had in this meal, and he thinks, actually, this meal I'm enjoying came from the hand of God. It wasn't just the result of my success. It actually was the result of him. Because who of us can make dirt from nothing, create a seed? Who, that little thing, what a miracle. You put a seed in dirt and water it and it grabs nutrients and turns them into corn. I mean, that's a miracle. And Solomon is looking at this and saying, oh my goodness, maybe this joy that I'm experiencing and accomplish things, this also comes from God. And this is realization number one. All your success is the gift of God. Your success in this life is actually God's gift to the person who wants to succeed and the person who has succeeded. For those of us who by some standard would say, we have really succeeded, have you stopped to consider this statement? Your success is actually God's gift to you. It is not something you've earned. Yes, a farmer farms a field, but without everything else going on, seed, dirt, air, light, space, his energy and strength and wisdom to know how to plant and how to water and the opportunity of that. Without God, none of it happens. Maybe our little participation shouldn't be conceived as our actually creating and accomplishing. What if every success you've ever had has been God's gift? This is exactly what Paul later says in 1 Corinthians. What a fantastic passage. For who sees anything different in you? Can we go to the next text? For who sees anything different than you? What do you have that you have not received? And the answer is absolutely nothing, including your success. It's been people smarter than you have worked harder than you have have maybe not succeeded like you have. Guess what? Gift. Some of us haven't succeeded in ways that we thought we should have, and we'd hoped that that success would give us something. (laughs) Maybe you're exactly where God wants you to be for his glory. And so if everything I have I've received, well, why do I boast as if I hadn't received it? How can I feel like I'm important for success that I didn't accomplish? It just was given to me. I was was in India one time, and we... We were up front, and they're, they're, back in the day, they used to pass an offering. And so I didn't know I was supposed to bring money, so I, was, I didn't have any money. And 
Emmanuel Reba, who leads the ministry, was next to me, and he saw my consternation in front of this whole group that I was about to speak to, and I wasn't giving an offering. And he leans over, and he hands me this money and says, put this in the plate. And I felt so, I'm like, I'm not going to put your money. He's like, no, do it, do it. And so I took his money, and I put it in the plate. And guess what? That wasn't mine. (laughs) Do you get the analogy that I'm trying to make here? Like, I contributed something, but what I contributed actually wasn't mine at all. What if all success is the gift of God? That realization is incredible. So back to verse 25. For apart from him who can eat or who can have any enjoyment, verse 26. For to the one who pleases him, he has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy. He has made all of this possible. Realization one, my success is from God. And reason for thanks. But second of all, that means that the purpose of my success is actually, why does God tell me to go achieve and accomplish? It's an opportunity to need him to use and express gifts that he's given, which he really likes. It's an opportunity to have him, Lord, I need this. Oh, you answered, thank you. It's an opportunity for interactivity with him. And it's an opportunity for that achievement to actually accomplish God's purpose and please him. I hope you're in a job in which you're bringing good to people in the world in whatever form, as an accountant ordering finances and as a therapist helping somebody have clear thinking and as a construction worker helping people have homes. You're ordering the world and that work actually is to God's glory. Let me share an example. I've I've shared this one before, but it illustrates this so incredibly helpful. It is about someone who gets gets achievement right and about someone who gets it wrong. Okay, the story is told in Chariots of Fire, which is the story of two runners during the 1924 Olympics that were in Paris. They were both British runners. One of them was named Eric Little, and the other was named Harold Abrahams. These two men were incredibly fast. They both won gold medals, but they ran for completely different reasons. What they saw success as being was completely different. Little was a Christian. And such a Christian. At one point, he still was convinced that, the, and this was his theological conviction, that you don't run on the Sabbath, that's work. So when his event showed up on the Sabbath, he wouldn't run. He ended up dying in China as a missionary. He had an incredible ministry. His sister was still alive when, um, when he was... Uh, when, he, when the movie Church of Fire came out. And she said, the only criticism that I have about the film is this... It doesn't show how Eric actually ran. It's only one moment when it does. But the truth is, can we go to the next slide? Every single time Eric ran, he ran looking up in the sky with his mouth open. And when the interviewer asked, why why is this the case? She said, because while he ran, he worshipped. Eric worshipped. Every picture you see of him running, he's like, he's looking up. He was the one who said to his sister, who wanted him to quit running and get on the mission field sooner, he said to his sister, God has made me fast, and I feel his pleasure when I run. This is fundamentally different from Harold Abraham's. Harold, if you know, ran and lost his first two races and had only one left. Harold ran believing Because he'd been so successful running, he kept getting better and better and better. Everyone wanted him to win the next race. And as long as he did, he felt it propped him up. It felt like he was important. It felt like he mattered. And so when he lost the first two races, he nearly disintegrated over that failure. What if I don't win? And so just before the third race, there is that moment where he makes that statement in the film, which I understand captures his heart, which is to say his fear about this race, I only have 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. See, one of these two runners was running to praise his savior. The other was running to become his own savior. Those are two fundamentally different things. This is how Tim Keller shared it. The first is running for sheer joy in Christ. If he wins, it's just icing on the cake. But he's not built his identity around whether or not he's winning, whereas the second one was running because he was churning with fear and struggle because he was seeking to be justified. That's what success does to us when we think it provides what our hearts need. God, God has... God has, well, let's just say it this way. The reason we have a dilemma is this. We live in a world, God has created your heart to yearn for much more than is in this world. 
and I'm going to spill the beans on a future message. I'll just share it here. Here's the secret. He has set eternity in your hearts. Your heart was designed for eternity and the taking in the glory and the wonder of Christ and somehow radiating that glory. That's what your soul was made for. Your soul is to be a part of great works that God will accomplish in the days ahead, to be in the middle of this thing that God is doing none of us can even conceive. So no wonder when you have the success here, it's a glimpse of that, but it's not that. What you're actually looking for is him. Animals are content just existing, but we were made for so much more than that. And so when somebody looks at success as if it's going to mean that they have meaning, the text says this, this also is vanity. He says it's just a striving after the wind. Okay, how do we respond to these things Solomon is telling us? Well, I would just ask this. First of all, are you hoping, have you been hoping success will validate your life? And no one's probably going to just nod yes, but I want to ask you, look deep in your soul. And ask the question, when things aren't going well, do you somehow make the move from that to whether you matter? Or if your things aren't going well, you're not, you're, you're not the valedictorian of the class. And things haven't, you don't leave a wake of transformed everything. Do you somehow conclude as a result of that that you don't matter as much? To the degree that needle moves, You've believed success means you matter. So pay attention to that reality. Hundreds of millions of people are throwing their lives headlong into the hope that if they succeed enough, they'll be happy. And it's a farce. It's a a colossal mess. Second of all, I want to encourage you to make it your aim to please God. In your pursuit of success, in pursuit of doing well, whatever it is you're doing, see that as an opportunity to need him To say, I got a problem here. I don't know how to solve. Can can I get a little help? Can I get a little help down here? For what gets accomplished to actually be pointed back to God so you can say, yeah, I didn't know what to do, but God really helped me out. To um, in that moment say, Lord, I had a need and I ask and you showed up and long after this project is finished, guess what? I have experienced interactivity with you. You have given me gifts and when I use them, it pleases you. And somehow would you turn what it is that I'm a part of into advancing the purpose of your kingdom? I know I'm speaking in very general terms here. Let me just give one example because what it will look like for each of us may be different. Another story from Keller. I'm sorry I'm quoting him so much, but he is so right on with this. Tim Keller, who's retired from serving at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, tells a story of it after, between services, he meets this woman walking around the building. And he says, hi, I'm Tim. And she introduces himself. And he says, why are you here? And she said, well, it's funny you say that. Um, something just happened at work this recently. I made a terrible mistake. Career, or not career ending, but job ending. What I did was so bad and wrong, I expected to be fired. But I wasn't fired. Instead, I told my supervisor who went to his supervisors and he took complete responsibility for what it is that I did. He said, it's his fault. It was a big deal. He could have lost his job. And he certainly, she said, actually limited his future advancement because he did this. So she went into his office and she said, I want to know why you did that. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he said, I want to know why you took the blame for what I did. I've had plenty of managers take the credit for what I've done. I've never had a manager take the blame for something that was big that would have cost them. And he's made some humble comment about, well, you know, that's good management and good leadership, and this is what you're doing. She's like, I'm not buying it. Really, tell me the answer. And he said, all right, you really want to know the answer? Here it is. Once upon a time, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, took responsibility for my mistakes and errors. He bore the price for all of them on the cross so I could be reconciled to God. So as I live my life, every now and then I have the opportunity to take the blame for someone else, and I do it because of him. You know her next question? Where do you go to church? And he said, Redeemer. And there she was. Because somebody at work realized that we we are to work hard and to work excellently and to work well, to honor God and to honor our employers. But we're actually serving a greater mission than just our job. We're serving the king. And what that looks like for you in your life 
could be many, many different things. My promise to you, though, is that you don't want to think of success as this thing that fills you up. It's God's gift and a place to meet him in it. If you don't think that, you'll have, you'll have soul getting, <laughs> not sewer getting. Um, uh, Trey said something in a meeting this last week that really, that really gripped me. Um, he noted that to be hungry physically, you stop eating and then you get hungry. But if you're going to be hungry spiritually, you can't stop eating. If you stop feasting on who God is in the word, you actually get less hungry for him. It's only when you feast on him all the time that you see him. And the more you see him, the hungrier you are. And the hungrier you are, the more you see him. The message here is that when it comes to our accomplishment, I want to go into that treasuring Christ. How is that going for you? Are you treasuring? Are you hungry tonight, today? Are you hungry for Jesus Christ? And if you say, I want to make progress towards being hungry for him, then the answer is simple. You have got to keep putting God in front of you. You've got to be open in the word of God every day. You've got to have music on in the background in your car. You have to surround yourself with a constant testimony of the greatness of God. And all you do is see him and he just carries your soul away. And then you come to accomplishing things and it's all about him. This woman saw in the man at work someone who could let his job go because his identity wasn't based on his job. It was based on something else. That's what you become like when you treasure him. Here's a fascinating truth. Anyone know what happened to Harold Abrahams, <laughs> the runner? So he, I found this picture. This is a picture of Harold Abrahams getting the parade he thought he always wanted. He was paraded through London for winning a gold medal because he did finally win that third race. But guess what? Nine years later, was the gold medal enough? He became a follower of Jesus Christ. He had not found in his success in running what he ultimately found in him. He's reaching out to you right now. He's telling you, see my greatness. Be in wonder about who I am. Live that life. <laughs> and then you'll walk through this life with him. Can we stand together? The prayer team is always up front. We would be honored to pray with you. If you say, I want to treasure him more than I do. I want to stop pursuing success as my God, if you will, or trusting it to be my God. I, or any other burden that you carry into this place. We would love to pray with you, but we want to take this time to look at who he is and join the song of the redeemed. He is worthy of all glory. Father, thank you for your love for us, for your word. Take these little words of mine and I pray we would hear you in them right now, that we would worship you. Put praise upon our lips as we give our attention to you.